Hi, this is part two of a three-part lecture on oscillations and waves. In part one, we looked at simple harmonic motion of masses on springs. In this part, we're going to look at simple harmonic motion of simple pendulums. All the images and figures that you see in this video are attributed to OpenStax College Physics, which is a publication of OpenStax.org and distributed under the Creative Commons Attribution License 4.0. In a minute, I'm going to demonstrate the motion, uh, oscillatory motion, of a simple pendulum. Uh, but before we do that, I want to outline the assumptions that we were, will make, some of the assumptions we will make, when we write down mathematical equations to describe the motion that we're going to look at. Uh, one assumption that we're going to make is that uh, the amplitude of the oscillations is always sufficiently small. A little bit nebulous what that means, uh, but later on you'll see why this is important. Uh, the second assumption is, like we assumed when we looked at masses oscillating on springs, there's no friction or drag incorporated into the equations that we'll look at in this lesson. Okay, so now let's uh, demonstrate pendulum motion for real. Here's a pendulum. A uh, pendulum is composed of some mass, which we call the bob, uh, suspended on uh, a string. And uh, the pendulum can be made to oscillate back and forth. And these oscillations occur about some pivot point, which is up here in this clamp. So a simple pendulum, when we say a simple pendulum, what, we're, what we mean is that uh, we're considering a pendulum where the mass of the string is negligible. And all of the mass is concentrated in the bob. In the bob. Uh, and if we're being more careful, a uh, simple, simple pendulum is an idealization where all the mass is a point mass located at a point in space. Okay? In the real world, there's no such thing as a simple pendulum, but this is pretty close. A very thin string and a nice concentrated bob here at the end. All right, so when you set a pendulum to oscillate back and forth, one of the parameters of the system is the length of the pendulum, which would be the length from the pivot point down here to the center of mass. Um, how do you think the period of the oscillations depends on the length of the pendulum? How do you think the frequency of the oscillations depends on the length? Take a minute to come up with a hypothesis. Think you have something? Let's test it out. All right, so for this pendulum of this length, I set it to oscillate back and forth. And I'll use this timer, the time, the period. Again, the period is how long it takes to complete one full oscillation. Start, stop. Can't see that. 1.13 seconds. Let's make the pendulum longer. Start, stop. 1.43 seconds. So making the pendulum longer made the period bigger, made the frequency smaller. So there is a dependence on the length of the pendulum and how fast it oscillates. But what about the mass of the pendulum? So I've set up uh, two uh, pendulums here, uh, and I've set it up in such a way that both pendulums have exactly uh, about exactly the same length. And I'm going to set them to oscillate at the same time. Uh, this pendulum is made out of wood, so it has a much smaller mass than this metal pendulum. And I'm going to set them to oscillate at the same time. We'll take a look at their period. So they oscillate the same. They stay, at least for a while, until friction, which is one of the things that we're ignoring, we write down mathematical equations to describe what's going on here, uh, starts to uh, take a toll. But at least initially, they oscillate with the same period and the same frequency. So this demonstrates that the mass of the pendulum doesn't matter at all. The mass of the pendulum doesn't influence how quickly it oscillates back and forth. The length of the pendulum matters, but the mass does not. Okay, let's look at one more thing. How about the amplitude of the oscillations? a little bit longer. Okay, so for small amplitude, really small amplitude oscillations, we get a period of about 1.27 seconds. 
slightly larger. We get a period of the same, 1.29 seconds within the margin of error of my little experiment here. It's exactly the same. So we see that the amplitude of the oscillations does not influence the period of the oscillations of a pendulum. We saw exactly the same thing when we looked at masses oscillating on springs. The, the amplitude of the oscillations didn't matter. Um, now there is one uh, thing to be careful with. Remember earlier I said that uh, the mathematics that we'll write down to describe what's going on here assumes small amplitude oscillations. So as long as the amplitude is sufficiently small, it doesn't matter exactly what it is, it will not influence the period of the oscillation. All right, so to summarize what we saw in the demonstration, we saw that the period of the oscillation got larger as the length, which is capital L, of the pendulum got larger. Uh, the frequency inversely related to period got smaller as the length got larger. Uh, we also saw that there was no effect, or I should say, uh, the, the uh, mass of the bob and also the amplitude of the oscillations had no effect on period or frequency. Okay. But again, always in the background, are, uh, the mathematics that we're going to write down in a few minutes only applies to small amplitude oscillations. So as long as the amplitude is sufficiently small, the exact value of the amplitude does not matter in determining the period and the frequency of the oscillations. So before we go on, uh, you know, why would a system like this be important? Well, uh, you know, Galileo observed that the, the period of a pendulum depended on its length, and uh, this led to the, uh, uh, the invention, eventually, the invention of pendula uh, or clocks that use pendulums to keep time. You can use a physical system to keep time, the motion of a physical system to keep time, and that's a pretty powerful discovery. So in our last lesson we saw that simple harmonic motion is a special kind of oscillation uh, that's characterized by two uh, properties. First, the restoring force that governs the motion is directly dependent on the displacement from equilibrium. And secondly, uh, the direction of the force is always pushing or pulling the thing that's oscillating back towards its equilibrium position. Okay, so uh, how is a simple pendulum uh, uh, like uh, uh, the system of a mass on a spring in regard to these two characteristics of simple harmonic motion? Well, uh, let's take a closer look. Uh, so what I've, uh, I have here is a free body diagram for a pendulum bob that's uh, displaced from its equilibrium position. The equilibrium position would be, get my pen here, when the bob is hanging at rest right about here. So if I perturb the pendulum from that equilibrium position, what force supplies the restoring force? The answer is gravity. The weight of the bob itself will pull the bob back towards its equilibrium position. Uh, so this is not, uh, the bob does not follow a linear path, it actually follows a, uh, a, a, an arc, and the displacement in this case could be represented by an arc length s. And if we look at the free body diagram, uh, when we perturb the bob so that the, uh, uh, the pendulum string makes some angle theta with the vertical, uh, the magnitude of the restoring force, the component of the bob's weight that's, pu that's pulling it back towards the equilibrium position would be mg sine theta. So we have a little problem here. Remember, simple harmonic motion is motion where the restoring force is directly the proportional to the magnitude of the displacement of the oscillating object from its equilibrium position. So in the case of the pendulum, displacement is s, this arc length. Okay, The magnitude of the restoring force is mg sine theta. So another way of representing the displacement from equilibrium is this angle theta. 
that the, uh, the, the string of the pendulum makes with the vertical. So what we have here is a restoring force mg sine theta that's proportional not to theta, which is what it would need to be in order for it to be uh, a, a force that uh, is appropriate for simple harmonic motion. No, here the force is proportional to sine theta. Not mg theta, mg sine theta. So we have a little bit of problem here. We have a force that's not directly dependent on theta, it's directly dependent on sine theta. So what we do is we notice that for small angle displacements, the sine of that angle is approximately equal to the angle itself. We call this a small angle approximation. So here we see why earlier we made the assumption that a simple pendulum obeys simple harmonic motion but only if the amplitude of the oscillations is sufficiently small because describing this type of motion using what we know about simple harmonic motion requires this small angle approximation. So with this approximation we can write the restoring force F as negative mg theta. Sine theta is approximately equal to theta. Um, why the negative sign? Because this force is always directed back toward the equilibrium position. Another little piece that we can use here is that when we're talking about arc lengths S, there's a relationship between the length of the pendulum here, which is capital L, the angle of displacement theta, and the arc length S. And that relationship is L theta is equal to S. So when we put this all together, we get the simple pendulum's restoring force when the angle of displacement, that is the amplitude of the oscillation is sufficiently small, is F equals negative mg L, the length of the pendulum, divided by S, this arc length, which is, can be rewritten, if we group terms in a slightly different way, like this. So what we have here is we have a force law governing uh, uh, the motion of this pendulum when the uh, amplitude is sufficiently small that looks a lot alike Hooke's law. Remember Hooke's law is negative F equals negative Kx, where K is the spring constant, X is displacement from equilibrium. So the difference is instead of an x, we have an s. Instead of a linear displacement x, we have an arc length displacement s. And instead of a k, we have a different quantity, mg divided by l. But this is uh, an interesting observation because what it suggests is that uh, with these assumptions that we made, uh, we can use all the things that we know about masses oscillating on springs, which are governed by Hooke's law, to understand pendula bob oscillating on strings, but instead of k's, we have mg's divided by l's. So in these equations, uh, these relationships that we derived in the first part of this uh, unit, anywhere there's a k, we can substitute mg over l, and now we have a new equation that instead of describing the motion of a mass oscillating on a spring, describes the motion of a simple pendulum. So in the equations that we derived earlier, anywhere there's a k, we can substitute mg over l, and the equation that did describe masses oscillating on springs now describes pendulum oscillating back and forth. So for a mass on a spring, we had the period of the oscillations is equal to 2 pi times the square root of the mass divided by the spring constant. So for k, we substitute in mg over l, rearrange and simplify, and now we get for a pendulum, the period of a pendulum is equal to 2 pi times the square root of the length of the pendulum L divided by g, the acceleration due to gravity, and the frequency of the oscillations of a pe simple pendulum are 1 over 2 pi times the square root of g over L, because frequency is 1 over t. So what we have here is we see that the period of a pendulum is proportional to the square root of its length, and so as the length gets bigger, the period gets bigger, and that's exactly what we saw in the demonstrations. Uh, these equations have no account of the amplitude of the oscillation or the mass of the bob, and we saw in our demonstrations that neither of those things influence the period or the frequency of the oscillations of the simple pendulum.
Another thing we see here is, is that the period and frequency of a simple pendulum depends on the acceleration due to gravity. On a planet uh, that has stronger gravity, that is, has a, a larger acceleration due to gravity, the period of a pendulum would be smaller. The oscillations would be faster. On the moon, if you, do, if you have a pendulum on the Earth and you take it to the moon, its oscillations will be slower. Will be uh, its period will be longer. Its frequency will be smaller because the acceleration due to gravity on the moon is significantly less than the acceleration due to gravity on the Earth. All right, so that concludes this lesson. Uh, the final lesson in this uh, uh, unit on oscillations and waves. We'll take a look at how oscillations and vibrations can couple to things in the environment and create waves that can travel through space.